introduce myself quickly. I'm Amy McMorrow Hunter. I'm here today representing my two businesses, uh, ShopCarbondale.com, which is a shop local web platform um, meant to help the, the local businesses um, boost their businesses, and then also TheClimateEconomy.com, which is to promote business models that are good for the environment, the economy, and humanity. So uh, on that note, I'm just going to go ahead and um, get started. So what we're going to do is we're going to give each panelist 10 minutes to talk about their area, and then we're going to have a discussion. And the main thing I want to talk about today, the main thing I want to pull out of this, is how do we manage this transition without leaving anyone out? What are the targets that we should aim for that are going to be the most widely beneficial to our communities? And what are the main challenges and what paths are there to overcome these challenges? So that's what we're going to be thinking about as we go through this. So um, I will invite Tim Michaels up here first to talk, and I will read you some information about Tim. Uh, he studied at the University of Houston and Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri, Master of Architecture. He's a registered architect in Missouri. He started Energy Resources Group, um, an energy consulting firm in 1975 to be a bridge between new technology and the built environment. He helped found Energy Teller, Inc. in 1985, which develops next generation power monitoring equipment from patented technology. He's a published author, lectures widely on energy efficiency and renewable energy to lay and technical audiences, and is an adjunct faculty member in the EECE department at Washington University. Let's give him a call. Thank you for being here. Um, my focus is the concept that energy is a tool of economic development, especially what we've got right now. So I've got a lot of little pictures here and stuff like that. I want to flash through them as quickly as we can because I'm 10 minutes, right? <laughs> So why do we want to focus on energy? Well, when I was in school in 73 and the first oil embargoes hit, I decided I was going to focus on energy and buildings because that's where 40% of the action was taking place. Um, industry uh, requires it in addition to the buildings. Renewable energy is already cost effective in the right context and with the right approaches. And it's extraordinarily beneficial to local economies if you can focus on developing your own energy resources through the golden, the gold mine that we've got in efficiency that not too many people talk about and the fact that renewables are here. I've waited 45 years, you know, mine, mining this mine <laughs> and now it's all cost effective. Efficiency has always been cost effective, but nobody ever gets that message out there. So, and then there's the risk management issue that is the focus now of climate change. Okay, sorry. So, what we don't understand and what most people don't tell you is you've got pretty good control over what happens. I'm a good news kind of guy. 
we individually control at least 33% of the energy used in the United States. And when you look at what our indirect control is, our demand on the rest of the economy, yes, we'd all like to have a job and get paid, so we want to work in some business or industry. And two, we want the goods and services to make our life feel better. So we're putting a pull on the other two-thirds of the energy pie. So each decision that you make about how much you're not going to buy influences how much energy doesn't get used. Okay, you've got the control. So if you look at it, the house itself is responsible for 20, you know, about 25, 23%, and then you're running your bodies around in a vehicle is another 11% of the economy. Okay, what we know and I know directly from 45 years of doing this that energy efficiency is there. It's always been there and we can go after it. And that it is cost effective to reduce your energy consumption a minimum of 25 to 30 percent with a less than four year payback. There's a approaching three trillion dollar market in the United States for stuff that will pay back in five years or less. Okay? And we've already hit this point. We're now net exporters of energy because of the fracking industry. But just efficiency alone would have driven us to that position. When you look at the fact that we got a $3 trillion interest industry, we can support about 30 million job years. Or we can put 3 million people to work for 10 years. And then at the end of that 10 years, we can probably recycle the process. We'll have newer technologies. All of this is no new technology. No new price incentives either, you know, the cost of... Whoa, I thought it was 10 minutes. Well, it took a while to get started here. <laughs> All right. Anyway, just to give you an idea of what's happened that's good, is when, when you look at it in 1993, oh, the green doesn't show. Come on, green's supposed to show. Can you take the light, turn the light out? Can you turn the lights down? Okay. Anyway, what this shows very quickly, since I'm going to be going into hyperdrive, we were told when I started back in the 70s that we had to keep using more energy because it was energy growth was, the, our economic growth was dependent on continuing to use energy at the same rate that we had. In other words, we had to keep wasting it. You can see that once we got kicked in the ass with the oil embargo, we decoupled energy use from economic growth. And as you've seen over the, you know, the 70 years or so intervening, we have managed since about the 2000 time frame, we've kept our energy consumption flat. And that shows that we grew, we grew our energy use 33% while we increased our economic growth 200%. That's a great yield on investment. Most people don't understand that. If we did just what's cost effective right now, today, for your payback, we would drop our energy consumption at least 25% from today's mark and we'd blow the Kyoto Protocol out of the water. That little, little red dot is where the Kyoto Protocol says we should be. If we did what's still more cost effective, or there's more cost effectiveness to go forward, is this is 50% and this would bring us to parity with the um, cost uh, the cost of growing an economy that's similar to Europe. In other words, Europe creates a dollar GDP with half the energy that we use in the United States right now. So they've already shown us it's cost effective. We just have to begin to follow a model similar to that. And if we got ourselves to using half the energy that we're using today, we roll ourselves back to the consumption levels of the early, well, the mid-60s, more or less. And that is a 12% plus or minus guaranteed rate of return on investment. Where can you get that in the market today? Guaranteed 12% and escalating as energy costs go up. Okay, that was efficiency. Now renewables. 
in, in 2015, the, the, energy, the EIA came out with this chart that said this is the value of uh, geo, you know, various uh, renewable energies relative to coal. Conventional coal cost is the yellow bar right there. And then renewable energy is often what is the green bars, if they show up as kind of green, which means that they are not dispatchable. In other words, again, the argument of whether or not it can be base load. Now, um, back then it said that uh, geothermal was our cheapest source. Wind comes on, and it turns out that wind is now as cost effective or more cost effective than geothermal. And hydroelectric is still going to be where it's at. We're trying not to do hydro because of its environmental damage. Biomass, is, there's plenty of biomass available that we're not touching. It's just sitting there. And you've got the stuff that we're doing in the labs that's unique, like algae. And all the waste that comes from animal feeding operations can be almost directly converted into energy for our use. And so solar photovoltaics is now, again, as cost effective or le less costly than uh, geothermal. Geothermal is very site specific. Wind and solar are somewhat site specific. And solar thermal has been talked about forever. I've even written books on it. And it's never really been cost effective unless it's used as passive solar. So what we have today from Deloitte and Deloitte.com, you look at that, they tell us that wind is now $30 to $60 a megawatt hour. Solar is $43 to $53 a megawatt hour. And that's compared to the least cost versions of conventional fuels, which is 42 to 78. We're at effective grid parity with solar and wind. Okay? We're not even talking about the opportunities of what I call reusable energy, not necessarily renewable, but all the opportunities in, in, in the industrial sector for combined heat and power, and then the organic waste that's out there. There is so much of this, and it's a tremendous opportunity for rural America. What we have to do is approach things with an integrated design and that means that we take a lot of perspectives into account, we encourage disruptive thinking, and we follow the example of nature. There's no such thing as waste. We've got to get things integrated. We're not separate silos of town, county, state, and federal. We've got to work together with the federal government, EPA, USDA, DOE, and HUD. First cost, energy cost itself, maintenance costs, and life cycle costs all have to come into it. No silo thinking. So I suggest we start with investment policies and energy. All of the communities that we work in have to learn how to do that. Develop a master plan of attack on, inner, on the buildings, homes, businesses. And then for renewables, there's direct solar, there's indirect energy sources co-products that we can produce when we're working on this, and then we have to find the money. Efficiency, it's there. You know, we got jobs, we can train talent, we can do the audits for homes and business, hire companies locally to do it. These jobs cannot be exported. And then sustain businesses over and over again. And then we get all kinds of opportunities for doing this with collaboration with programs like the USDA has that can be very, very beneficial in rural America. There's all kinds of linkages and crossovers that we don't have time to talk about. And then renewable energy, it's the same. Again, USDA is all over the map with this potential in rural Illinois. And just as a final example, since I don't get to say any much more, um, <laughs> If you built a home and you did it conventionally and you went to net zero, you'd save $35,000 over a 30-year mortgage, which is less than the cost to do it. On the, and then there's utilities that have got incentives and it's a community effort. And there's a lot of people that are out there to work on this together. And we're all part of the crew. Thank you, Tim. And 
I do apologize. I have to be this like time Nazi person, and I I don't want to be that hateful person, but <laughs> I have to do that today and keep us on schedule. So I do apologize, and I know that everybody has questions and everything, and so that's why I want to do that working time later. So now I'm going to introduce Karen Schalker. She is she earned her master's degree at SIUC in 2015 in geography and environmental resources with a specialization in local foods and sustainable agriculture. She joined SIU Sustainability Office in late 2017 as the program coordinator. She's a member of the Saluki Energy Focus Group, so am I, and the Tree Campus USA Committee. She currently serves on the board of Food Works as well. Past experiences include voter registration, native plant landscaping, teaching K-12 garden education, and working on a university farm. to be invited and to be a part of this conversation today. Um, SIU is um, always excited and willing to be a part of community conversation. So again, um, I'm, I'll be here afterwards and if anyone wants to continue the conversation, because I know this will be short, I'll be here and, and I'm happy to do so. Um, as you can hear from my bio, um, I have a lot of experience in sustainable agriculture and if anything that shows that in the when we're working in sustainability um, a lot of us are generalists and not necessarily experts so although the the focus of this panel today and here is on energy um, I, I like to share with you the resources that we use to guide our conversations and a little bit of history about the sustainability office in general however if you have very specifics and very specific questions about energy at SIU, um, you would want to, to direct those questions to um, our engineers at the Physical Plant and Service Operations. I do have a little bit of information from them today to share with you, um, but again, if you have more specific questions, you can send them to me and I can pass them along and we can hopefully answer those questions for you. Let's see. Um, SIU uh, uses several uh, guidance markers to, to show our progress in sustainability. Um, we're happy to receive these recognitions um, from the advanced, um, the uh, STARS assessment. Uh, we're considered a silver university. Um, we're also a tree campus USA, um, given by the National Arbor Day Foundation. And we're also, at this point, a bronze level bicycle friendly university. Uh, we were also recognized as a cool school by the Sierra Club magazine. Um, as mentioned before, we really use the STARS assessment as a way to measure our progress. It's a self-reporting tool through AISHI, which is the Advancement of the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. You can see that these are the main metrics in which we, um, we measure our progress. Um, operations is probably on the third one on the list. That's probably the closest connection to our conversations today in terms of renewable energy and greenhouse gases. We also use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to guide our work and our conversations. Um, this past spring we had an event um, that was planned by community partners and we will also have an event coming up in October. I think several of you were a part of that previous event, but we invite all of you to join us in that continuing conversation and the event that will be coming up in October. So if you'd like to get more involved in that, please see me at the end of this presentation and, and I can guide you towards that. The Saluki Energy Focus Group is one of our current working groups. So to give you a brief background, the Sustainability Office was established in 2009 by a group of students who wanted to see a sustainability presence on campus. And so they looked to see what other universities were doing and they saw that the student green fee was one way to fund a, a sustainability operation on campus. So they got a resolution passed through the student government and through the board of trustees and they were able to establish a student green fee, which is still the main financial driver or the, the only financial driver of the sustainability office currently. So keep that in mind, this began as a very bottom-up approach, and so we are still working with that model. 
However, now that there are two people in the sustainability, myself as the sustainability program coordinator and my supervisor, who some of you may know, Jory Kurtzals, we've shifted the conversation to more strategic initiatives such as our working groups. The Saluki Energy Focus Group is one of those working groups. We also have a working groups um, on water, air and climate, food and transportation. And these working groups are composed of not only students, staff, and faculty, but also community members. And we are currently in the process of establishing what our objectives and goals for these working groups will be. So we're looking to see what other institutions use. We're looking at what STARS assessment uses to, to measure those benchmark improvements for universities. And we're also um, establishing ground rules ourselves as a unique situation and a unique community in our, in our own right. Um, so the Saluki Energy Focus Group has, has um, we've determined what our goal is. And it's kind of a, it's a two-fold approach. It's energy efficiency and also maximizing renewable energy in terms of procurement. Uh, we've so far had two events um, on campus. The first event was a keynote speaker composed, um, or keynote address, um, given by a geography and environmental resources professor, Justin Schoff. And that, that, uh, that event mostly um, was aimed, or it was a, 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 it was a reaction to the IPCC report that had just come out in November or October of 2018. And so what Justin Schoff did for us was he helped to, he helped to, um, to articulate and to interpret that very long report for us. And if you're interested in hearing more about that particular <coughs> event or that, that, um, that address, you can, you can find that on our website. Um, and so I've, I've actually listened to it two or three times at this point, and each time I pick up something more. Um, so that's available on the Saluki Energy Focus Group web, website. Um, our second event was just this past spring, and um, that conversation was focused on our actually our actual campus energy mix and, and energy on campus um, itself. Um, and that address was given by Justin Harrell, who is our PSO engineer in um, at SIU. Um, this is a flowchart that Justin Harrell has actually provided that I reference many times. You can see um, you can see the main uh, demands and sources for our energy at SIU. Um, and oh, the the really important uh, uh, line in this chart is actually not visible, and it's the losses line. Um, it's very thick and significant. Um, but all of that goes back to the conversation around energy efficiency and the losses that our current system has. Um, a significant portion of our on-campus energy is used for our cooling and heating boilers. Um, you can see uh, that one picture on the top left is our off-site electricity that we also purchase is a significant portion that we use. So this is another resource that I'm very enthusiastic to share with you if you haven't seen it so far. It's called Drawdown. Um, I have the book with me today. This is the cover, but there's a lot of information available on their website as well. It's a really exciting resource. Um, it was a drawdown. It, what is drawdown? Drawdown is the point at which we are reducing the concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And what Drawdown, the book and group is, it's a coalition of scientists and researchers and policymakers. And they have, they ask the question, first of all, is Drawdown possible? Are we going to be able to reduce the concentration? And they, they answered their own question and they luckily, it was a resounding yes, we are able to reduce our concentration. And the other question they asked was, do we have the technology to do that? And, and Luckily for us, uh, not luckily, but through the work of hard of, of people, we do have the technology, and we are able. We will be able to scale those technologies up. Um, it is possible to scale those technologies up and to reduce those those greenhouse gases. And what they do is they they divide these um, existing scalable, economically viable solutions that are currently within our grasp. Um, they, they divide them into different categories or sectors. Um, there's several sectors such as food, 
um, obviously uh, energy and electricity, but there's also some surprising sectors like women and girls in terms of education and opportunities for women worldwide. Um, transportation, health and well-being. Um, and this is the, the brief pie, pie chart for the solutions with the potential largest impact um, in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. And what they do is they quantitatively, um, they quantitatively establish what each solution's impact could be based on the different rates at which you scale these solutions. Um, these are the top 10 solutions that they've, that they've determined um, based on their research. Um, some of them are surprising, and again, like I said, some of them are not so surprising. Number one was a surprise to me. Um, it's uh, uh, not often in the conversation, but it's refrigerant management. Um, so in terms of uh, as, as um, more people worldwide are um, seeking the lifestyles that air conditioning provides um, and, our, and our middle classes are growing in some areas of the world, um, there's a larger demand for air conditioning and there's also um, uh, the issue with the cooling mechanism um, when at the end of the lifespan okay uh, that's sad um, at the end of the lifespan um, that can cause uh, significant harm to the atmosphere uh, so that's number one number two is right up our um, alley in terms of what we're talking about today. Electricity generation, wind turbines offer the second largest impact um, in the drawdown mix of solutions. And the third one, which is also a surprise, um, is in the category of food, which is reduced food waste. Right now, our, our, um, in the United States, 40% of the food that we produce is currently not being used. And so um, there's a efficiency um, uh, an efficiency uh, possibility um, in that sector as well. Um, so again, I'll be here if you have any questions later or if I can help you um, to direct your specific questions to people at SIU who might have the, the correct answers for you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. And I just wanna say that we would love to hear everybody a lot longer today. And we will hopefully have more events like this. And we're going to hand out a survey later where you can mark down what you'd like to hear more of and things like that. So. I just had one question. Is, uh, since people have to kind of condense their presentations and they're doing an excellent job for doing this, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that we could get the slides? Yes. The slides will be available. So we, could, we can review them. The slides out. will be available as well as the video of the entire event broken down by okay, each and where session. Will that be? That'll be on the website, theclimateeconomy.com. Oh, all right, thank you very much. Yep, you can grab a card back there. It'll have the website on for you. Okay, I'm going to introduce Ord. Ord Anjuman Beck is an energy efficiency advocate, an IBEW electrician, and is double NABCEP certified with his company, Advanced Energy Solutions. Installing solar since 1999. He's a founder on the board of the Illinois Renewable Energy Association. He has a weekly radio talk show, Your Community Spirit, but he would like to be known mostly for Oil Addicts Anonymous International, a real 12 step program. <laughs> I am an oiladdict.org. In his spare time, he likes to volunteer through a rotary. Uh, good day. I just recently uh, joined Toastmasters, so they, if you go over the time limit, you're kicked out. You failed your speech, so let's see if I can do this. Um, I started doing renewable energy full-time 20 years ago. June 4th, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary. But we're not, we're partying all month. So you guys are invited at the end of the month on the 28th to the actual party. Um, we just installed a solar system on a customer who happened to have a DeLorean, so he's bringing that. If you want to see solar and a DeLorean, he, I think he might let people get a ride, but I don't think he'll let you drive it. Were any of you guys around a few years ago during the direct show? So two weeks after the direct show, I started my first full-time cold to soul training program at Johnny Logan College. Now I showed up, I didn't know anybody was registered because for a week after the direct show, the power was out. So I didn't know if anybody signed up. I teach that class 
every semester. I'm kind of unique in the industry that I've been trying to clone myself for many years. I try to teach and train others, hopefully create a competition. And until two years ago, there was next to no solar installed locally here. Our company installed in eight states because that's where the work was. Now, I want to go back, way back in history. The reason I started my solar training classes at the college, I was doing classes on my own, is I got invited to be trained by this guy called Al Gore to do the Inconvenient Truth presentation. <coughs> and that was part of what he said in his thing. He said, go out and get ambassadors. And so when I came back, I did a few Inconvenient Truth presentations, but instead of doing that, I started training people how to install solar energy. Now, in the beginning of that whole presentation, I talk about the climate. I talk about why people do solar. Going back even further, I am very proud that Albert Bates is here because at the foot of Albert Bates and at the foot of Al Gore in the late 80s, they would have debates about the climate and I got to learn at their feet about how the world is going to end. I was a teenager. And for a long time, I was, I don't know, crazy on trying to get people to get renewable energy. That doesn't work. You only can be crazy if people follow you. And it's taken a while, but what's happened is something very interesting here in coal country. The environmentalists aren't leading the charge here for renewable energy. It's the average Joe who says, renewable energy will help my pocketbook, the green in my pocket, let me do it. They're helping the environment as a side, but what do you think of someone who installs solar? What kind of image do you have in your mind? I just installed a solar system that in the middle of looking it over, the wife came out with a machine gun and shot at the groundhog on the dam <laughs> wearing her NRA hat. And the husband was a retired coal miner wearing a Trump 2020 hat. In southern Illinois, that's who buys solar. Why? Because that's who lives here. They're not environmentalists, but they're doing it, and they're helping the world by helping themselves. <clears throat> and I feel in the environmental movement, we way too often create an us versus them mentality. And by doing that, when I, when I, Five years ago, when I set up at Johnny Logan at the hunting and fishing days, I don't know how many coal miners would come by and like almost spit at my face because you are killing the industry. That's not the case anymore. They realize that we are trying to help them with this transition. And with the new state program that's trying to come on down the Literally, there is money set aside for small towns that have had coal mines closed for them to be retrained. And so I hope, I don't know, someone should probably copyright it, the Coal to Soul Retraining Program. I started that 10 years ago, and I hope you guys all become solar ambassadors and come to my party at the end of the month. So, thank you. Stay energized. So next, we were going to have Amanda Panko, 
um, from the Prairie Rivers Network. She was scheduled to be on our panel. She had some travel issues. She was in DC yesterday and she missed a flight. So in her place, Christina Crost from Faith and Place is going to talk, talk to us and show us her slides. We're an interfaith earth care nonprofit. Uh, I live in Harrisburg, and so I am here in Southern Illinois doing outreach around uh, energy, around sustainable food and land use, water, uh, and advocacy. And so all of those things kind of come together right here. So the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, uh, as you can see up here, is a group. Uh, of environmental justice, faith-based institutions, watchdogs like Citizens Utility Board, Sky Allen is in the back, um, public health, students like SIU, clean technology business, entrepreneurs working alongside civic and community leaders to advance clean energy jobs across Illinois. And we did that, you can look at these pictures here, you can see there were a number of press conferences held in late February to roll out our um, newest effort, which is the Clean Energy Jobs Act, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, but you can see this was really a statewide thing. There are a variety of press conferences here that were held all over the state. Uh, you'll start to see as we go through this presentation that um, being statewide is really important to us. Uh, we know here in Southern Illinois that perhaps we don't always get the attention, the funding uh, that we really need. So that is why the Clean Jobs Coalition exists, um, to try to make sure that everybody is heard. So the Future Energy Jobs Act was our first shot uh, as a state at renewable energy legislation. And so FEJA, as we call it, uh, passed the General Assembly at veto session in 2016. Um, so you can see that it got pretty good press coverage there as well. Um, trying to promote renewable energy. And so here was what the Future Energy Jobs Act uh, set out to do. We had solar and wind incentives, renewable, renewable portfolio standard goal of 25% renewable by 2025, uh, incentives for rooftop solar, utility scale solar, community solar and solar for all programs as well. And we are starting to see the benefits of that rolling out right here in Southern Illinois. Um, like right now, it's actually happening finally. Energy efficiency was another pillar of this, lowering our electric bills, saving money and creating jobs, and that is an ongoing thing. Workforce development as well, which I think is maybe the most exciting thing I hear about down here, in that we need jobs, and there are jobs to be had, but we need a little bit of training for those people. So solar training, like Orr was talking about earlier, has been happening at John A. Logan for quite some time, and that will continue. Um, apprenticeships, multicultural jobs program. One of these job training programs uh, takes place at Lutheran Social Services in Marion. Um, they had their second training group go through recently, um, and I know at least one of the guys is hired into um, renewable energy right now. I don't know what the actual final totals are. They just graduated like a month ago. So uh, that work is ongoing and it's happening right here in Southern Illinois. So after the success of FIJA, we wanted to take that a step farther. And so now we have CJA, which is the Clean Energy Jobs Act. So to take FIJA forward, we actually solicited input from people, actual people that live in Southern Illinois. Uh, and central Illinois and the suburbs of Chicago around the state. There were 70, more than 70 listen, lead, share events held and that map there shows where some of them were located. So we decided 
as part of the Clean Jobs Coalition that it would be silly to write a bill that affects so many people if we didn't actually get community input. So this is a pretty exciting thing that Illinois did. Lots of states are taking notice and saying, well, gee, we probably could be doing this in our states as well. So Illinois is really leading the way here. Um, sometimes we hear about, about Illinois leading the way in ways we don't like. This is a way we can be really proud that uh, other states are taking notice of how we've led this renewable energy movement. Um, several of these as the lead chair events were held right here in Southern Illinois. One at, at SIU, one at John A. Logan. Um, there were a couple, there's one held in Murfreesboro, um, one in Marion, and so right here in this community, people were able to give their opinions, fill out a survey, preference what they thought was most important in renewable energy jobs, and what was least important. And so to say that the public helped to create this jobs bill, this clean energy jobs bill, is actual truth. We can actually say that with integrity, um, rather than uh, other politicians <laughs> using that uh, for their own personal gain. This was actually uh, what happened. So there's four pillars of the Clean Energy Jobs Act, again, taking the FIJA and moving it forward. 100% renewable energy by 2050, carbon-free electric sector by 2030. We're increasing electric vehicles. That, vehicles that target is trying to take about a million uh, gas vehicles off the road and quality jobs and investments in communities across the state. That looks also like communities that have been hurt most uh, and need the most just transition um, should be at the front of the line for benefits. So the thing that Illinois has done well, and I have a list here, I just looked this up last night really quickly again because um, I'm pitching in here for Amanda, but um, as of June 10th, uh, which was you know Monday, right? Uh, the renewable energy laws that have passed in our country, Colorado, Maryland, New Jersey, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, New Mexico, and California, um, have all passed some sort of renewable energy legislation. In progress, we have New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, no, sorry, Maine, <laughs> Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. So we've got some that are in progress as well and are working towards renewable energy legislation, but Illinois prioritizes justice. And as a person of faith, um, this is what impresses me so much about this bill. A just transition. Providing support for communities and workers impacted by closures, reduced utilization of coal. Um, we have these clean energy empowerment zones that will be set up, um, Southern Illinois being you know, prominent among that. Allocating state economic development resources for new business tax incentives and workforce training for workers. Um, this is what builds a new economy in Illinois. Uh, this is where the future is going. This is how we do it. We've done it together. We've written this bill together. This is how we go forward. Um, if you want more details about this, I'm happy to speak uh, later on. I'll have the table back there with the teal tablecloth. Amanda will be here. She'll be happy to answer your questions too. Uh, and Scott Allen from Cub is back there as well. He's really smart and he would be a great resource for you as well. But if you want more information, IllinoisCleanJobs.org would be where you'd want to be. Uh, PrairieRivers.org, we partner with Prairie Rivers uh, quite a bit. They're an outstanding organization. FaithInPlace.org also for uh, any creation care needs at your houses of worship as well. I think I'm gonna sneak out of here with time left over, so thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. All right, we're gonna just start quickly here. Um, we'll just try to read through the three questions I asked at the beginning. If you could just take each of you a brief opportunity to answer this question based on your experience and your resources and just to, to help people here understand um, what we can do about energy around here. So the first question, what are the main challenges and what are paths to overcome these challenges? Tim, you want to start? What are the main challenges and what are the paths to overcome these challenges?
challenges we're not getting the word out because we have all the tools. The technology is there. There's no new technology required, at least for energy efficiency, which I consider the green of. Is the mic on or can you go closer to it? It's just I don't know. Uh, we've lost our city. Do I need a mic? Yeah. If you talk loud, you're okay. Well, I know it's a problem. You know, yeah. helping the end. But uh, we, we have, in my mind, the major problem is we're not getting the word out. Nobody understands that efficiency is truly an economic boon for everybody. So we just have to keep working on getting the word out. I've been trying for a long time to find folks I can cooperate with where we can do things like, say, the campus and take it net zero, but have the institution working with uh, somebody like PBS to do a documentary on how you make that process happen so that it can be replicated by everybody else. So we have to have uh, paradigms. Well, it's a paradigm shift, and we have to document how we make these shifts happen, and a lot of it has to be cognitive uh, shifting that goes on. We have to stop thinking about renting our power and owning the assets of power ourselves directly. So it's either community or it's an individual or it's a business or institutions. And we just have to have those kinds of folks take the lead. I've been trying to do it myself. I don't, I don't have air conditioning. I've never had air conditioning. I put solar on my roof. And I forgot that I'm only, I, I net meter it back to Amity at two and a half cents because most of my production is in the summer when I don't use air conditioning. So, live and learn. Thank you. Yes. What are the main challenges and what are the paths to overcome these challenges? Let's just say for what you're talking about. Mike over there. Are you trying to get uh, I, I guess I would say that um, the way that this transition is managed is probably the biggest challenge because there are a variety of outcomes, some of which are terrible for communities and some of which are great for communities. And it's really important that um, local areas uh, and, and regions try and get ahead of how they're going to go through some of these changes. Because um, on the good side, as I mentioned, um, the opportunities from solar and wind for local energy production, local energy independence, lower electric rates, and benefits, financial, direct financial benefits to communities is tremendous. Um, and on power assets, as Tim just mentioned, right? Um, the downside is, though, that some of that whole process can get easily co-opted. Um, big utilities are not really interested in letting local areas take the money that would be generated and sent to shareholders and, and uh, you know, at headquarters. Um, so there's lots of things that are happening where the system is being challenged uh, both uh, in obvious ways and very insidious ways to try and prevent the renewable energy from getting uh, built at the local level and being, uh, having money go to the local level. Um, that can be in the form of challenges to, to uh, connecting your solar system to the grid. It can be challenges to who's allowed to own um, power generation assets, right? So there's lots of ways that this whole uh, in many ways, beneficial and wonderful system that has come about at a grassroots level can get interrupted and, and stopped in its tracks. And there have been state, you know, you may not have um, some of the big lobbyists come into your uh, county to stop this stuff, but they're sure at the state house. And so some of the states, like North Carolina to some extent, and certainly in Ohio, um, some other states, uh, Wyoming, Montana, were recently debating about this stuff whether it's to promote fossil fuels or to um, de-incentivize places uh, from building renewable uh, power generation, mm -hmm. that's happening a lot at the state level and can really stop this in its tracks. Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned before, 
Um, at SIU, we really rely on our collaborators and our sustainability advocates um, to voluntarily participate in sustainability initiatives. I think to take us forward, we are looking for a larger strate strategic buy-in and commitment at an administrative level. Um, we, as a, as a place of higher education, um, we have many aspects to think about, whether it's academics, research, um, student life and student engagement to operations. And so there's really an opportunity in all of these areas um, that provides a unique situation. Again, I would say looking at what other institutions provide or have already done offers some really good models for us to um, look at to provide some resources for a pathway forward. Um, and so um, I think using commitments that are out there like Second Nature, um, using our STARS resource, and then also seeing, looking at what other institutions are doing um, can provide a pathway forward. I'm going to disagree with everybody. There's nothing stopping us. I mean, literally, right now, everything we've talked about is cheaper than conventional energy. It's being put in widespread everywhere. The problem is, it's going to take us a little while, because we just started doing it. It just became at what they call grid parity. So, Renewables are at that same level. Now, maybe if they quit, I don't know, subsidizing conventional energy at a high level and just made the level playing field, it might speed it up a little bit, but I don't think so. I think right now we're going as fast as we can with what we have. Um, pretty much the only thing we as individuals can do is use less energy. The rest of the world uses half the energy as we do, and we just waste a lot of energy. What is waste? Energy wasted is money lost. It's that simple. So any business that wastes energy is losing money. Anybody who's wasting energy is losing money. It's that simple. And so we just need to realize and start doing it. The rest of the world is. They're skipped over us. They're going right to renewable energy. Why? Because it's more affordable. and paths to overcome the challenges. I'm going to speak from my context, which would be the faith lens. So please indulge me for a minute. Um, we have forgotten that we belong to each other. We have forgotten that when one suffers, that others suffer. Uh, we have forgotten and we have ignored that fact. And so as a person of faith, where I know that I can make an impact on someone else, when I know that I can reduce my consumption and that would help someone else, um, I'm called to do that, or I feel called to do that as a, re a living response to my faith. Um, and so I, I see trends in culture and I see these things you know, as we develop, um, that we're moving away from the idea that one may affect someone else. Um, so, to me, that means energy efficiency in my home as much as I can do. It means teaching my children. It means uh, teaching my house of worship how to be a better consumer, how to reduce so that the rest of us may live more abundantly. Um, those are my particular uh, views on how this works. So, that informs then how I go out and work in the world. That informs why I feel so passionately about um, faith and environment uh, working together. Um, teaching people how to be more energy efficient in their homes um, may not seem like a faith thing, but if I can reduce, someone else you know, can breathe a little bit easier. And so learning that that is a way to walk out my faith um, is very important to me. So that's my two cents.
okay, we're just going to take a little bit more time here. I want to open it up to the audience, but please only raise your hand if you have a question for everyone on the panel, like that everyone can answer briefly. Does anyone have something? Um, I'm, my name is Phelan. I am 26 years old. I live in Hartlandale, um, and I work in organic farming and local sustainable agriculture. Um, what would be your recommendations to someone who wants to work with the local rural community and farming community uh, to invest in this energy transition in a way that would directly feed back to that community? Like, What would your recommendations be for me and my colleagues um, in our field, what we could do in that rural setting. So recommendations for people in a rural setting as far as clean energy and the transition is concerned. All right, do we want to go through each person again, please? Uh, I'm trying to no. I'm going to switch over the bottom and change it. <laughs> My opinion is rural America is going to be the savior of us all. Okay. Uh, the opportunities are rife. They're everywhere. I mean, this is where the best solar energy is captured. It's converted at a low rate for carbohydrate production. But uh, it, it's, it's there in terms of community and a myriad types of jobs that can be created. One of the things I've been trying to do is work with CAFO operations. I haven't been successful yet, but they're one of the largest environmental polluters locally, and, but they could be one of the better solutions. All that animal waste can be readily converted into things like methane while you're cleaning up the environment. So that creates local jobs out the wazoo. You, you know, you can do it with digesters, you can do it with uh, more conventional chemical retort types of things where you can, uh, you know, not quite fish or trope, but other kinds of opportunities. And then once you have local economic energy, you know, you can create the uh, abundance of opportunities through the local co-ops and reach the grids through the co-ops. You can produce something called RINs, renewable, well, let's see, RINs are renewable identification numbers off of natural gas that is RNG that you produce renewably. You're buying RIN, you're buying natural gas out of the Gulf of Mexico at 350 a million BTUs plus or minus, depending on market at the whale head. You can get the equivalent of solar RECs for renewable natural gas that can total up to about $50 a million BTUs. So there's a big arbitrage opportunity there. That will feed industries. You've got the local energy, you can bring jobs in to create other industries around it. Uh, you can do uh, off of that waste heat that you have from all of this electricity that you could be generating, you can develop uh, aquaponics. You can remove food desert uh, problems locally. And each one of these things creates another job two or two hundred, you know, it's there. So I think there are um, tremendous opportunities here to take the framework of knowledge that organic farming and sustainable farming has and bring it uh, think more broadly about it because um, I'm not sure that that necessarily uh, organic and sustainable agriculture is thinking about energy in the same way that they're thinking about agriculture and I think it's going to pose a whole series of new uh, ch you know opportunities and challenges if um, if your farming equipment is all electric and you're, and you're charging that equipment with solar panels on your farm, that may change the way you think about um, agricultural processes, for example, right? Um, so, but I think that the idea of sustainable and organic farming around community, around um, uh, efficiency and low impacts, is really appropriate in many ways to apply to the broader energy picture. Um, 
On top of that, what I mentioned earlier about the opportunities for um, non-agricultural income to help sustain operations because you've got a solar, maybe uh, a utility scale operation on a bunch of farms in the area, um, whether it's community solar or whether it's providing your own power in sort of a more energy independent way, there's all kinds of ways that um, I think rural America really has an unbelievable opportunity here to take back sort of a means of production, and that means production is energy. I mean, you know, farmers have in many ways lost control of the seed as the means of production to big, to big agriculture. Okay, I'm just fighting words here. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but, but the same thing is true in energy and the ability for individuals and bigger businesses uh, to be able to produce their own energy is a tremendous opportunity here. And, and I, I think that the, the, the framework of, of sustainability is really appropriate here, but it's got to be expanded to consider energy in all the different ways that that's going to impact communities. I'm not sure if I quite got the question. It was, it, to me, it was really broad. Um, so um, I guess what, what, what's going through my head is the first thing I, thing I always rely on is collaboration and learning from other people around you. So that would mean hooking into organizations like FoodWorks, um, meeting your, your local farmers who you probably already have relationships with, and so you, you can share techniques. Um, going to conferences such as MOSES uh, for, for the MOSES conference in the Midwest, and then it's the SAW conference in the Southeast for, for sustainable farmers, and meeting them and, and networking with them and finding solutions. Um, I also think about the connection between climate change and sustainable agriculture whether it's greenhouse gas accounting or whether it's the role that soil and healthy soils and carbon plays in, in um, our future climate um, situations. Um, I think about uh, uh, what it can do for healthy communities too. So sustainable agriculture is really one of those things that it's, it's multidimensional and interdisciplinary and it hits on so many aspects of our, of our lives that I think that's where its real potential is, that it's not one thing. Um, and that there's opportunities for um, learning new techniques and practicing those new techniques and um, has a, we choose to eat three times a day as people say, we vote three times a day and thinking about um, that impact and how we, we all have a role to play and whether you're a consumer or a producer or an advocate um, it's really um, all-encompassing, so it's hard to hit on anything one specific, so I apologize. So farms are a business, and right now under the incentive programs, businesses get 90% incentives. So the systems we've installed on farmers this last year have been substantial. Now that federal incentive starts sunsetting. We've got a couple years left of the federal incentive and it will go down for a business um, from a current 60% down to 10%. And so a lot of farmers are looking. Um, we had one farmer in El Dorado that we gave him a quote to do 100% of his energy and he's like, no, I need bigger than that. And I was like, well, that'll do 100%. He's like, well, I need the tax credits more than I need the energy. Because again, if 90% of it's get the money back and only the last 10% is the energy part, that made sense. It kind of was interesting to me. The other thing I've been seeing that's been happening, um, farmers are getting older and don't have anybody to take their place. And so that particular farmer was looking for somebody and that was last year and this year he found somebody to basically take over his farm. He's going to start teaching them and we're talking a thousand acres. That's what he farms. 
right? But the main thing I think what's happening in rural America is diversification of crops. I don't know if you know, but this spring, as of right now, only 26% of the soybeans have been planted and only 56% of the corn. That's it. Next year, corn is going to go up because we. this is the last date right now to plant corn. And only 56% of it's been planted in Illinois. So the price of corn, anything that had corn, which is everything, is going to go up. And farmers are really paying attention because this is affecting them tremendously. So they're doing it. They're out there doing it. They're making changes. So. So um, I think that not just in rural America, but everywhere in America, we've kind of forgotten where our food comes from, who it impacts, um, uh, the justice um, of our food system. And so that's an education piece that I work on uh, through Faith in Place. We have an online curriculum that you can download for free called Just Eating uh, that can help houses of worship closer identify uh, what are the most just ways of eating, how, does, how do our choices impact others, um, and how can we more align how we want to care for our creation uh, through how we eat. And so that's, education is, a, is one piece that I feel like we need to do at the small you know, house of worship level uh, that I work with in our homes, uh, in our groups, we need to be talking more about this. Um, and another piece that um, I don't know that we talk enough about, and, and or touched on a little bit, is educating a new generation of folks to, to support our food system. Um, people don't, <laughs> my husband's a pastor, and uh, people don't grow up and say, boy, I want to be a pastor when I grow up, right? Uh, people don't grow up and say, boy, I want to be a farmer when I grow up, at least not where I grew up, but I grew up in Metro Detroit and everybody worked in the automotive industry. Another good example of how when you don't diversify your economy, that's really bad when something economically disastrous happens like did in 2008. I lived there with my family. We experienced great financial hardship. Uh, it was not great, and so I don't want to see those kinds of things happen down here either. Um, and so educating people and maybe promoting an idea of um, trades are important, farming is important, good education in those industries are important, those feed our country and that feeds our world. Um, and so perhaps placing um, a new emphasis on the honor uh, of, of that kind of hard work could go pretty far in, in this country. Um, and there's one more thing that I don't think I've touched on enough, and I haven't heard anybody touch on either, um, but that's a um, part of the Future Energy Jobs Act that was so interesting and so um, made me so feel so passionately about it. And going forward, uh, and in, in continuing with the Clean Energy Jobs Act, uh, would be carving out um, places to train returning citizens and foster care alumni. Um, I know a handful of folks in um, the church that my husband serves that I attend that work in the prisons, uh, prison systems down here. Um, and getting folks who are transitioning um, out of that system and back into um, society, um, we need to be supporting them uh, and getting them into industry so that they can then support their families going forward. And so putting some support in, in those kinds of programs I think is really important. Um, to help make our communities healthier. Um, so, that's all. <laughs> okay, that is awesome. I have gotten a lot of